Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I am Chair Clarissa Rodriguez, and I now call to order the 971st meeting of the New York State Workers' Compensation Board. The board secretary had a family matter to attend to today. Representing the office of the secretary is Administrative Assistant Virginia Cawthorn. Ginny, will you please call attendance? Uh, Vice Chair Foster. Here. Board Member Peprock. Here. Board Member Logan. Here. Board Member Williams. Here. Board Member Hall. Here. Board Member Osley. Here. Board Member Crane. Here. Board Member Stasco. Here. Board Member Lavelle. Here. Board Member Higgins. Okay. It appears that Board Member Higgins is absent today. May I please have a motion to excuse the absence of Board Member Higgins? Motion Someone? to excuse. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. Agenda item number one, approval of the October 16, 2018 meeting minutes. You have all received a copy of the October meeting minutes for review. Are there any questions or need for discussion? Move to approve. Second. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. Agenda item number two Office of General Counsel's departmental report. Supervising Attorney Keith Longdon will present the statistical and informational report for October. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'm going to briefly summarize uh, the statistics um, for October 2018 for the three divisions in the Office of General Counsel uh, responsible for deciding cases. Um, first, the Adjudication Division in the month of October held 20,638 hearings, uh, resolved 12,659 cases at hearing, and issued 557 reserve decisions, um, also approved 2,000 55 uh, Section 32 waiver agreements. The Administrative Review Division uh, received 1,002 um, applications. They processed 1,212 applications for uh, an end of month inventory of 3,927 cases. Uh, finally, Legal Affairs Division received in the month of October 152 applications for full board review. Um, processed 168 applications, and had an end-of-month inventory of 297 cases. And that completes our report for the Office of General Counsel. Okay, thank you. May I have a motion to accept the statistical and informational report? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. Now for licensing applications. Elizabeth Lott of the Office of General Counsel will now present any licensing applications this month. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez, Good morning. Vice Chair, Board Members, and guests. You have before you the recommendations of the assigned board panels regarding the license applications listed in Part 3 of today's agenda. The board panel recommendations are as follows. Section 24A, Mark Berman, one-year renewal. Michael O'Keefe, two-year renewal. Section 53B, MAC Risk Management of New York, LLC, three-year renewal. Section 53D, NSTAR US, Inc., one-year term. AmTrust North America, Inc., three-year renewal. North American Risk Services, Inc., two-year renewal. Creative Risk Solutions, LLC, one-year renewal. I present these recommendations of the assigned board panels to the full board for your decisions. Okay. Are there any questions or need for discussion? We'll May I have a motion? Thank you. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I'm also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you so much. Uh, legal appeals. Supervising attorney Keith Lending will now present the recommendations concerning decisions by the appellate division. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, on the agenda are nine cases um, by the appellate division, third department. Uh, with regard to decisions of the board. It's the uh, recommendation of the Office of General Counsel that in item 4A, it's Gene Johnson, matter of Gene Johnson versus Alltown Central Transportation, um, that the board uh, authorize um, the Attorney General's office on behalf of the board to file a motion to re-argue um, or in the alternative for leave to appeals to the Court of Appeals from that decision. Um, do do all all and the remaining cases, items 4B through 4I, it's the recommendation of the Office of General Counsel <coughs> the board 
adopt the decisions of the appellate division third department as the decision of the board okay thank you are there any questions or need for discussion may i have a motion to accept the recommendations of the office of general counsel motion to accept okay thank you um all in favor aye, aye. Oh, oh, you didn't second. Was second. there a second? Thank you. <laughs> um, all in favor, once again? Aye. Okay. All opposed? I am also yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. Okay. Agenda item number five, mandatory full board review. Case number, case 5A, L3 Technologies Incorporated. Case number G1780143. Is there a motion with respect to 5A on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the opinion of the majority be adopted as the opinion of the full board. Thank you. Is second. there a second? Thank you. Uh, does anyone need to be recused from this matter? Is there any opposition to the motion? Yes. Okay. In light of the opposition, I call upon Jenny for a roll call vote. Board Member Osley? Yes. Board Member Logan? Yes. Board Member Hall? Yes. Board Member Williams? No. Board Member Crane? No. Board Member Pat Brocky? Yes. Board Member Lavelle? No. Board Member Stasco? Yes. Vice Chair Foster? Yes. Chair Rodriguez? Yes. Motion carries 7 to 3. Thank you. 5B, Coca Cola Inc., case number G1076085. Is there a motion with respect to 5B on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move that the majority opinion be adopted as the opinion of the full board. Okay. Thank you. Are there any recusals in this matter? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing and hearing no opposition. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. 5C, People Care Incorporated. Case number G058. 4708. Is there a motion with respect to 5C on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the dissenting opinion be adopted as the opinion of the full board. Is there sure. a second? Thank you. Any recusals in this matter? Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay. Seeing and hearing no opposition, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. 5D. Village of Herkimer, case number G061579. Is there a motion with respect to 5D on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the opinion of the majority be adopted as the opinion of the full board. Is there a second? second. Thank you. Are there any recusals in this matter? Is there any opposition to the motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. In light of the opposition, I call upon Jenny for a roll call vote. Remember Jeff Rocky? Yes. Board Member Logan? No. Board Member LaBelle? No. Board Member Williams? No. Board Member Stasco? Yes. Board Member Hall? Yes. Board Member Crane? Yes. Board Member Osley? Yes. Vice Chair Foster? Yes. Chair Rodriguez? Yes. Motion carries 7 3. Thank you. 5 E. Right Way Internal Removal. Case number G2022173. Is there a motion with respect to 5E on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the opinion of the majority be adopted as the opinion of the full board. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any recusals in this matter? Yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> is there any opposition to the motion? Back that up. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> okay. Uh, in light of the opposition, I call upon the Ginny for a roll call vote. Board Member Stasco? Yes. Board Member Osley? Yes. Board Member Hall? Yes. Board Member LaBelt? No. Board Member Paprocki? Yes. Board Member Logan? Yes. Yeah. Board Member Crane? Yes. Board Member Williams? No. Vice Chair Foster? No. Chair Rodriguez? Yes. Motion carries 7 3. Okay. 5F. Alcoa, case number G1830073. Is there a motion with respect to 5F on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move to deny full board review based on improper service. 
Okay, is there a second? Second. Are there any recusals in this matter? Any opposition to the motion? Okay, seeing and hearing no opposition. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes, that motion is passed. Thank you. 5G, U.S. Airways, case number G0749114. Is there a motion with respect to 5G on the agenda? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move that the dissenting opinion be adopted uh, as modified. Madam Chair, I need to refuse. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any opposition to the motion? Okay. Seeing and hearing no opposition, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Thank you. Agenda item number six, discretionary full board review. I turn this portion of the agenda over to Vice Chair Foster. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the cases listed in item six on your agenda, it's been recommended that full board review be granted. Those cases are 6A, matter of MK Landscaping, Inc., 6B, matter of Baywind Senior Living, and 6C, matter of Empire Architectural Metal Corps. I move to refer the cases back to the respective panels for further consideration. Second. Is there a second? Thank you. Uh, any recusals from any of these matters? Okay. Any opposition to the motion? All right. Seeing and hearing no opposition, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? I am also a yes. That motion is passed. Agenda item number seven, uh, any other business? Okay. Agenda item number eight, our guest speakers. Today I am pleased to announce that we have two guest speakers. We have the board's executive director, Mary Beth Woods, as well as a special guest, Mark Johnson, chair of the New York State Self-Insurance Association. First, I introduce our executive director, who will provide us with a annual overview of the board's activities. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. So when I started to prepare for this presentation this morning, I was trying to figure out what's the message to convey. And if you think a little bit, it's November. Everyone thinks about Thanksgiving and how grateful they are at this time of year. And I think it's an important opportunity for us to, to pick it, basically take a step back and say thank you to all of you, as well as the remarkable team of dedicated and hardworking staff we have here at the board. Today I'm going to share with you some of the great accomplishments that have been achieved in 2018. A lot of these accomplishments you've heard about, they've been on, uh, there have been press releases, there's been social media, but there have been a number of them that have been behind the scenes without the public fanfare that have been accomplished nonetheless. And I think it's important to point out that people are working really hard regardless of the public praise. They're here, they're dedicated to the system, they want to make sure that they make the system better for everybody that interacts with them. And they work hard knowing that they're making a difference, not just at the board, but in the lives of the people that interact with the Workers' Comp Board. So big thank you to our team, and let's get started with a little bit of the 2018 accomplishments. Let's see if my technology is going to work today. It's not. Okay. So I'll just wing it from here. How's that? So uh, I'm just going to give you an update on the regulatory side of the world, some information about our operations team, the adjudicatory side of the world, our financial services, and then a few other program updates that you may or may not be familiar with. On the regulatory update side, we have uh, regs, regs have been finalized in the legal clinics, and I believe we've briefed you before that, as you know, there are a lot of medical-only cases where it's difficult for an injured, an injured worker, excuse me, to get a representation uh, to be able to handle whatever medical issue has a in their case. This will allow us to work with um, law schools and the bar to make sure that we provide representation for these individuals when the need arises. It's a, it'll be a great opportunity for them to get the services that they need. We also have uh, regulations that are just closing the second round of public comments for the drug formulary. The drug formulary is going to be a list of drugs that you can prescribe for an injured worker within a certain time frame. Anything that's not on that list will require prior authorization. So that was required as part of the 2017 reforms. We are hoping to review those comments and finalize those regulations, hopefully by year end, so that we can adopt it uh, mid-2019 and give people time to program those changes in and get ready to go for new prescriptions starting you know, on or after sometime mid-2019. 
medical fee schedule, we have not updated our fee schedule for the most part since 1990s. Uh, our, our providers are really um, entitled to a, a fair wage for the service they provide. We went back to the fee schedule with the idea of making sure that we were paying at least Medicare, in most cases Medicare, plus 20%. So that was the goal. You'll see most of those fees are in line with that. We did not reduce most of the fees uh, to extent they were uh, codes that were no longer used. We eliminated those codes to the extent there are new codes that have uh, evolved since our last publication years ago. We've included those and reflected those in the proposal. So I think largely we have gotten the public comments back. There are a few tweaks that we may still be making, but we're hoping to finalize that shortly as well. On the operations side of the world, we have, uh, as you know, a new head of operations, Dina Jones. She's been working very hard to make sure that we streamline the, the process that we have in place for examiners to make sure that we are working efficiently and to make sure that we are trying to reduce any duplication of efforts throughout the board. That has resulted in reductions in the work use for the examiners. It has also reduced the number of unsets. When we talk about unsets, we mean the number of cases that are sitting currently in a queue waiting to go on to a hearing. And so we used to have over 10,000 people or cases waiting for hearings. And now I'm happy to say that we're, we're, we're less than half of that today. And if you think about the average inventory of 1,000 cases a week, we have roughly, you know, the three or four weeks of inventory that we would normally expect to have in order to set cases three or four weeks into the future. So we are back to, you know, I don't want to say exactly current, but it is a very quick turnaround now. People who have you know, issues that need to be raised and need to get here. So once they're determined to be eligible for hearings, they should get on here and take these days. We also have a business information system update for you. We have a draft of request for proposals for our new claims engineering system that went out earlier this year. The responses from the potential vendors are due back <coughs> mid-December last year. So mid-December, we're hoping to get a few uh, great proposals in and get our re-engineering efforts off the ground in 19 and uh, really try to replace that claims information system that we have. We've also talked to you in the past about the medical authorization system. So this is a system that's intended to really electronically provide medical information to the providers in the system. So for example, medical treatment guidelines. A doctor may come in and say, I have an individual who has this type of injury. You can go into that system, look up the injury, look what the recommended course of treatment is, and see if what you want to do is acceptable under the treatment guidelines. If you get to a point where they say, no, that's not an acceptable treatment, it'll tell you if you'll get a variance request. If it says it's an acceptable treatment, it gives you a number, and it'll say, go ahead and do the procedure to offer as a treatment guidelines. So we're hoping that does two things. We're hoping that that tells the provider to go ahead and treat, which will give them some assurances that they're within. The other thing it'll do is hopefully cut down the number of requests that we get for variances and authorizations just because they want somebody to tell them it's okay and they're gonna guarantee, get guaranteed payment. So we have a lot of people who really enter into our system and ask for a variance and an authorization, and they don't really need to, but it's really a lack of awareness, a lack of comfort about the way the system should work. So we're hoping that this new medical portal will give them that assurance to just move forward and provide the treatment. That is expected to go live in the first quarter of 19. There will also be other phases of that we'll, that we talked about, and potentially um, to once you come up against that, you need a variance information window. It will allow you in the future to really actually fill out the variance, submit it, and it'll go electronically to the carrier for all the authorizations. And that's phase two to be developed later in 19. But I think the you know, the message is we're, we're trying to make sure that people get real-time treatment, the doctors get some assurances about getting paid, and so the medical part of the system will move quickly. And last, I know we talked to you about this before, but we are very impressed with the hard work for the team that's been working on our compliance and monitoring. We have a timely first payment, which is historically at a high level. We used to be less than 40% of the first payments were paid on time. Now we're you know up around the 90% mark. So that's a doubling of where we were. And that really goes a long way to making an injured worker very comfortable about you know, their case. You know, everybody knows that that paycheck is a critical part of your daily life. Making sure they get that quickly is really a, a very important part of our business every day. They also are looking at the first report of injury. So it's important to know if an injury occurred so they can get prompt medical treatment that the employer has an awareness of it so they can get the resources to them that they need. Those numbers are also at historically high levels. 
And in 2019, the team is looking at a couple other benchmarks we're going to set up in place to try to, again, continue that monitoring to make sure that we're hitting you know, the expectations under the law of when services should be provided and when um, people should be responding to certain types of uh, inquiries and actions. On the adjudication side, great news, virtual hearings is no longer a pilot. It's alive and well, and it's been implemented statewide. So today we have 26 locations, 23 of them already have virtual hearings up and running. Queens will be the next site that will be coming out shortly. And so all of our district offices will have full virtual hearing. As of October, the numbers showed that we had 85,000 hearings that took place in their virtual hearings, and about 40% of those had at least one person coming in virtually. So that's a great number, and I think what we're going to find is come, you know, the winter especially, people will take advantage of that system that will allow the injured worker to stay home in bad weather and get their hearing done, they can participate, they can see everything that's happening. It's a tremendous system, it's, it's really, um, the technology is just incredible. Uh, so I think that you'll find that that will be used more and more in the past, and as it progresses, we'll certainly come back to you with additional statistics to show you how well it's working. As I mentioned before, our onsets are at an extremely low level. We're very proud of that, and I'd like to also say that our adjudication team is having a large uh, effort into that as well, because they are making sure that these hearings are getting on the calendar. So Madeline and her team have done a tremendous job bouncing these cases uh, to available judges to hear these cases to make sure that we are losing any available calendar time for these cases. So we have used the remote judges when necessary. We've used, you know, uh, higher level of scheduling, so it's been a tremendous partnership between operations and adjudications to get that where it is today. And I certainly want to applaud all of you in the room, as, long, as well as Cheryl Woods' team and, and uh, ARD, that the inventory and the appeals is at a like, historic low. I mean, it's, it's incredible. We've gone from having to wait maybe 18 months for an appeal to get resolved to now it's less than six months and they're really doing a tremendous job and you guys are you know, really helping them along by uh, keeping up with the, the volume that's been passing through. So hats off to all of you as well. I did want to mention to you, which um, I know we've talked a little bit about this in the past, we had a financial management system that was extremely outdated, no longer being supported. And so in 2018, we actually launched our new financial management system. We're very excited about it. It allows us to pay our vendors electronically but what's equally as important to us, and it has this new e-bill pay module. And what that allows someone to do is if you have a bill with the board, let's say you have a, a compliance penalty or, or five of them, you can go online and see what your penalties are, and you can identify which ones you want to pay if you're not going to pay them all, and, and click off on them and make that payment. In the past, we, we get thousands and thousands of checks. And we might get a check that's, you know, here's $50, but it's, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy for it. What is the $50 for? Why, why do they get paid for the bills? Like I can maybe track the employer, but they have like 16 outstanding penalties, so I don't even know where to apply this. So we spend a lot of human resource time trying to track this down and keep our records balanced with what they're trying to do. This will allow us to make sure that they're applying the payments wherever they want them to be because they'll collect them and tell us what they want to pay. So it'll be a much more efficient system for them, certainly much more efficient for us as well. We've gone from having 15 bank accounts to one much simpler for us to be able to reconcile at the end of the month. We have a much stronger, much more robust reporting capability to understand what's happening in the system. So as we told you before, we process, you know, we spend about $1.1 billion a year. And only $200 million of it was on the state's accounting system. The remainder part of it was in our antiquated financial management system. And we had a lot of spreadsheets, you know, a lot of Excel works, but we didn't really get financial statements. So this new system will allow us to really pull out that information, understand better what's happening within these programs so that we can you know, effectively manage them. And last, I mentioned the process efficiency. So for us, not having to handle all these paper checks, being able to run automated reports, that will give us a lot, of, a lot more time to really analyze these funds and these transactions as opposed to just kind of you know, entering information. So it'll be a really good uh, ability for them to kind of change the way, they look at, the way we do business. A couple other things I just want to quickly mention for you is, um, as you know, we launched paid family leave in January 2018. I'm happy to report that we have tens of thousands of people who have taken advantage of it this year. It's been a very successful program. We have done tremendous amounts of outreach. 
Missy and her team have been all over the state. We put out you know, thousands and thousands of brochures and we have webinars and all kinds of things to get the word out. Um, I think that the good news is it's people are hearing that it's out there, they're taking advantage of it. When the next up for 2019 is an increased benefit level, we're going from 50% of your average weekly wage to 55%. We're going from eight weeks of benefits to 10 weeks of benefits. And uh, the carriers are in the system. So the good news is people are being able to use it, and we have a very robust number of carriers who are willing to participate in offer the coverage. I think there was a lot of concern in the beginning that potentially the carriers wouldn't necessarily want to offer the product. So we have a few new carriers coming in. And I think the good news is it's working well, the information is getting out, and the benefits are getting stronger. The 2017 reforms required us to do an independent medical exam study. We had 2018 as the board's time to do a utilization review, and in 2019 we're required to convene an advisory panel. The statute sets out certain mandatory members on that panel, and then the, the chair has the discretion to bring in anybody else that, that she chooses. So we are finishing our work on utilization review. We've done a tremendous amount of data calling. We've done a data call from the IME entities. We've done a survey from the individuals who participated in those IME exams. So we've done a lot of uh, behind the scenes data gathering so that we can present good information to the advisory committee when the time comes. This advisory committee is required to put out a report to the governor of the legislature in December of 2019. So we'll continue to work with them over the course of the next 12 months to see if we can come up with any kind of agreed upon recommendations for the IME process. And last is the CMS 1500. <clears throat> we had announced uh, kind of an effort to bring more providers into the system. It was a two-pronged effort. We talked about increasing the fees for them as well as trying to cut down the paperwork. So the CMS 1500 proposal is our, our initiative, I should say, to try to cut down some of the paperwork. Most healthcare providers are familiar with the CMS 1500 form. That's how the health insurance industry works today. That's their claim form to, to get paid. It also allows us to get the health information that we need for the workers' comp portion of the claim. So, so transferring over to this 1500 is going to be targeted for the first quarter of 2019. There are a few um, uh, things we have to work out with our information technology team to make sure that we're able to receive the information and we can get the carriers the information that they need. But once that's resolved, we expect to go full steam ahead and ultimately we would like to convert this to um, you know, kind of the, the mandatory system that everybody uses. It will be similar to the way we work in the health insurance world. We will always provide an option for people who you know, are not accustomed to dealing with it and can provide you know, paper or whatever it needs to be. But this is really going to be kind of our standard as we move forward into the new 2019 agreement. So what does it all mean? That's a good question. Basically, it's uh, meaningful improvements to the system. We have faster payments to your workers. We're trying to ensure more access to care. We're getting issues resolved much quicker in the system. We're lowering the cost of the system. As you know, the rate is going down by 11.7% this year. And we're providing more consistency statewide. We've done a tremendous amount of education between the judges, the examiners, um, to make sure that when they get a decision in one part of the state, the decision is consistent across the rest of the state. That type of consistency reduces the number of litigation points we have, and it really provides people with a very meaningful, strong framework for continuing the system. The other thing that we want to make sure that people understand is, that, you know, it's better for workers and better for business, but we also want to go out and kind of promote the hard work that the people here at the board have been doing. I know when people talk about workers' comp, and I'm sure you have all been in that situation and say, oh, you work for the workers' comp board. So we want them to be, oh, you work for the workers' comp board. That's <laughs> right. So the goal yeah. is to kind of go back to a multifaceted campaign. We want to highlight these accomplishments. We're putting together new materials. We're trying to make sure that we have more outreach so people understand that people behind the scenes are working really hard to make the system a lot better. And so I think you'll find 2019 will bring them a lot more bragging. We're trying to really make sure that people understand that it's a new workers' comp board. It's out there to really serve the needs of the union worker, serve the needs of the employer, and make sure that you know all of the system expectations are running smoothly. So I wanted to say thank you to the chair for your leadership. Thank you to the board members for all of your hard work. And a very hearty thank you to the team at the workers' comp board, the thousand plus employees who really come to work every day and make sure we have a better system. So happy Thanksgiving to all of you, safe travels, and thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Now I'd like to welcome our second special guest, Mark Johnson, Chair of the New York State Self-Insurance Association, who is here to speak with us about the association's work. Some of us are already familiar with Mark, as he serves on the Board's Advisory Committee for Self-Insurance, as well as our Advisory Council. In addition to his chair, to being Chair in Advisory Roles, Mark is currently Manager of Corporate Medical Services and Director of the U.S. Workers' Compensation for Eastman Kodak Company, where he has been employed for the past 37 years. During his time with Kodak, he's held numerous positions, such as a safety engineer, senior ergon er ergonomist, ergonomist, yeah, that's what I said, <laughs> and, <laughs> and divisional HSC manager within the Corporate Health, Safety, and Environment Organization. Prior to Kodak, Mark was a safety engineer with the U.S. Department of Labor, OSHA. Mark received his undergraduate degree in industrial engineering from Rochester Institute of Technology and his master's from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for asking me to come. Yeah. I appreciate being here. As a longtime New Yorker, <laughs> if you think saying I work for the New York State Workers' Comp Board stuff, say I work for OSHA. <laughs> My father-in-law won't even let me on to his construction site for his house, which probably was good because he didn't have to do any work then. <laughs> uh, when I talked to the chair about coming, uh, when I was invited, uh, I said, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, we had a short discussion, about five, ten minutes long. and. Um, what I would like to do is share, I'll talk about what New York State self insurance Association is doing, but I want to give you a little bit of a different perspective of a view of workers' comp as I've seen it. I've been at this for, I keep saying I'm a newbie at it. People that have been around me say, no, Mark, you can't say that anymore. But um, as you can understand, I started out with OSHA as a safety engineer. My degree is in industrial <coughs> engineering. Industrial engineering is people engineering. My specialty in that area is ergonomics, and it's all about designing for people. So that's what I've spent essentially my whole career doing until a number of years ago. I went over on a three-month assignment to help medical be outsourced, and here I am 15 years later. I am Kodak Medical, and somewhere along the line, workers' comp jumped in there, and my whole learning of this has been on-the-job training in this whole medical workers' comp arena. I've been very, very fortunate in groups like the NYSIA, the Rochester Chambers Workers' Comp Group, and some of the people in this room where I've had the opportunity to interface with them, to talk with them, have them explain things to me, give me some understanding. And quite frankly, that's been my education in Workers' Comp. But I attack Workers' Comp from an engineer's standpoint because that's, you know, you grow up in that, you're trained that way, you practice that in your profession. And then all of a sudden, you're thrust into this field. So when I look at things, I think of things from an engineer's perspective. And if you have time, I'll tell you an interesting story at one of the self-insured advisory meetings one time where this really hit me head on. But basically, the engineer wants to know, what do you want done? Why do you want it done? And then we go after the how you do it. And that's where my mind goes. When somebody brings up an idea, all right, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How do you get it done? That's different than just about anybody else in the workers' comp arena. Because when you look at that, everything about it's a debate. Attorneys are paid to argue, pro, con, con, pro. I don't attack it that way. I look at it and say, all right, what is it we're trying to do? Why do we want to do it? And how do we do it? So when I see things and get into meetings and things, <laughs> that's my approach. So that's what I want to share with you is my perspective of what's going on here. Um, NYSIA, for those of you, I'm assuming most everybody knows what that is, New York State Self-Insurance Association. We did a little check in January of 17. We have a very small number of members, 32 members at that time, that were active self-insured employers. Those 32 employers employ over a half a million employees in the state. That's a big swap. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, having come new to that group, the people that I've met there are professional to the core. And I've got to say, the people that I have talked with and encountered there, employees are very important. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the literature these days saying that, you know, 
employees are only going to be there for two or three years or are moving on and on and on. But I'm here to tell you that, at least I can speak specific for my company, and I think for a lot of the MRSA members, that's not how we look at the employees. We, we understand that they're probably going to do that. But we have to take the approach as an employer that they're here for the long term. We've got to make a long term investment because you don't know if and when they're going to go. But you've got to build things understanding that they may. They're a huge investment. My company in particular, you look around, our average age has actually dropped. We were at 57 about three years ago. We're down to around 54. Okay? When, you, when I started, you know, I've got 37 years, I'm working on 38. I just had a, a health associate leave. She retired as of Monday, was her first day retired. She had just finished 43 years. You know, at Kodak, when I started, you weren't really felt like you're part of the family until you got 25 years in. <laughs> I'm standing here at 37. I look around the, when I go to meetings, I look around the table. And in our organization, we've had a huge turnover. My kids are older than the people sitting around the table with me. And those are the people I'm mentoring so I can move on. Uh, you know, people have asked me then this morning, when are you going to retire? I don't know. I'm having, I'm enjoying what I do and I'm making a difference. And that's my wife and I both are in line of doing this type of thing. And we're both cured on making a difference. So that's, I don't know when I'm going to retire. I'm thinking three years somewhere out there. But, um, well, we do value our employees. The primary purpose of the NYSIA is, is really to help employers uh, to put together a network so we can share ideas discuss issues, share problems. We watch, oversee pending legislation, provide input on it, and share the comments with our, our memberships. Um, we look at all the relevant issues around workers' comp and try to be a spokesperson for the self-insured. You know, we sit on the advisory committees and such with the board, and our whole idea is to have a dialogue. It's not to say no to everything. It's to understand what, why, and how. And what can we do to make this a win-win for everybody? Because we understand we've got to look at our employees in the face every day. I can tell you right now, for me, every accident that happens in my company in the United States comes across my desk. And one of the first things I do when I review the incident report is we have an online directory. And that directory, you can print that person's page. And it has a couple things in it that I always look for. You got this vital information on the person, where they work, and their phone number. But it typically has a photograph of the person, and at the bottom, they can put down what their favorite books are, favorite movies, favorite quote, and they can put personal pictures. They can be everything from their dogs to their kids. I had one person put Doris Day's picture for her picture. <laughs> what was comical about it is I was standing by one of our young receptions desk when this picture came up, and I said, do you know who that is? And she read the woman's name. I said, no, that's not her. It's Doris Day with a, with a pill hat on. <laughs> Of course, this girl had no idea who this person was. <laughs> but I print that sheet on every accident report, and that's my cover sheet. And it reminds me that this is a person. You know, I go back to when I was in, in school, when I was co-oping, when I was with OSHA. It's a person. Every incident's a person. You know, I've been in hospital rooms where people had their legs ripped off. I've gone and talked to people that had a family member killed on the job site. I know what it's like. When I, as a safety engineer, when somebody got hurt in my areas, when I first started with Kodak, they thought I was crazy because they, they thought I was mad at somebody. And I was. I was mad at myself because I took it personally. When we had a significant incident, I would, I would go out there and they could see that I was upset. And it, I repeated, I'd say, I'm not upset with anybody except me. Because I feel I probably should have identified that. I missed that. How did I miss that? So that's how I take all of this. So I come at this a whole different way than a lot of other people do. Okay? Um, what I, what I want to share with you is some of the things that, that uh, when I talk with my management, and we've had a lot of turnover in the last 10 years or so that I've been with Kodak, with senior management and on down. And people don't understand workers' comp until you get engaged in it. And one of the things that I tell them first is, take everything you know about the judicial system in this country and throw it out the windows. That's the first thing you gotta realize. I said, when an employer goes into a workers' comp courtroom, hearing room, 
I said, we're guilty. Our job is to prove our innocence. The law is written that way. It's implemented that way. And as a no-fault policy, that makes sense. And when you, that's, a, that's a shocker for that, because you hear everything else the other way. But you need to understand that, and you need to really appreciate that. And that's why in our judicial system in the country, you got to prove somebody guilty, not innocent. It's very difficult to prove your innocence. So just understand that from the employer's perspective. That was a, a, an eye-opening thing to me, because I always come from the other side. Um, the other thing that I tell people, and I tell it to our management, I tell it, I've said it to the board people, I've said it to our actuarials, and anybody that's doing something with workers' comp. If you think I'm not interested, you're wrong. As an employer, I'm furiously interested. Because every penny that goes to workers' comp comes out of me, the employer's pocket. The employee's wages, their medical, their comp, your pay, your travel expenses, the rent for this building, everything revolving workers' comp comes out of the employer's pocket. So yes, as an employer, I'm very concerned about how we do things. I want it done efficiently. I'm not trying to rip anybody off, but I don't want to waste money. And, I, and that is important for us. And I'm going to say, I'm speaking for myself, for my employer, and I'm going to say for NYSIA, because the people that I've met there tend to follow in the same thought process. We value our employees. We're in this for the long haul, not short term. You know, I, I can speak, like I said, my folks, they've been around for decades. And they're here because of that. Um, one of the things that struck me and my company in the last year or so, you know, we've had financial problems. We went Chapter 11 several years ago. We're out of it. We're still struggling. But it's, it was eye-opening to me to sit in an auditorium with three, 400 people and have the CEO of the company say there's three things right now that's holding this company back. It's our headwind. The first two weeks were easy for us. Aluminum, because we make printing plates. And the tariffs haven't helped us because the aluminum we need is offshore. It's not made in the US. No one makes it. The other is currency exchange, because we are an international company. We make in the US, sell abroad. We make abroad, sell in the US. We you know, get it all over the world. But the third one shocked me. Out of his words came workers' comp. Those are our three things that are giving us the headwind that we're trying to fight against. And it came up again this quarter. Workers' comp was one of the headwinds, along with currency and aluminum. No advance warning to me. I'm sitting here listening to this, and workers' comp keeps coming up. So if you don't think financial workers' comp has an impact, I'm going to tell you right now, with my employer, it's one of the top three financial issues that we deal with. And we're a good performer. You look at our safety record, we are notoriously good with our safety record. <coughs> and we continue to improve with that record. Um, most of our employees, I'm going to say in general, when you look out there, this is the other thing I explained to my management, because everybody comes up with a horror story. And I don't care whether you're on the employer claimant side or on the employer side. Both sides can point to horror stories. Listen, I was a compliance officer for OSHA. I've been called a Nazi Gestapo ring for an hour in a manager's office. I've seen those managers. They exist. <coughs> I've seen those supervisors and I've helped them educate those supervisors and retrain those supervisors and managers in my own company. But I will, I'll stand up here and tell you right now, there are just as many there are more good employers and there are good, more good employees. I see every workers' comp claim in this country for my company. 90 plus percent of them, they're, they're, everybody's in tune. Get them fixed, get them back to work, make them whole. That's what we're after. And I can find, I know there's employers out there that are in that same situation. But I can also tell you there are a couple, there are that tail end of the distribution of employers and employees, not too proud of. The problem is those that few percent 
is what taints everything else. And that's what we bring up. And that's why one of the things I want to bring forward is we need to look at the data. Look at the information. I applaud all the work we've been doing the last couple of years with the board. We've been able to put stuff in the computer so we can analyze the data. But you not only have to get the data, you have to understand what the data means. So I'll give that caution to you. How did that number get there? Because you may be making false assumptions about what that number means. And I can think of one specific case that we had at one of our advisory meetings. I won't go into that here because of time, but I think what people need to realize is don't focus on that tail end of the distribution. Most people are good. Most employers are good. Those few odd ones, and I tell my manager, don't get caught up in that one or two that you know went south. Well, I can, you want to give me a bad employer, I give you a bad employee. You can play that game all day long. Leave it. That's in the politics realm. We're trying to make things work here. We need to look at the information and come to the table and work as partners to get this squared away. Um, one of the things that we focus on very highly in our organization, I'm in a unique position. And people, you read literature and talk about having an integrated program. Well, I am responsible for all medical in the U.S., which includes absence management, assessment surveillance exam, so people with respirators are hearing, that all comes through my office. If somebody's out of work for occupational or non-occupational, you have an occupational injury, I have a nurse assigned to you the day you report. If you are out for a non-occupational injury illness, after you're out a week, or we know you're going to be out a week, we assign a case manager to you, a nurse case manager. Their objective is to help you get to care you need and to work with getting you back to work safely, in a timely manner, and productively. My vendors that I use are given, are graded on how long people are at work. There's something called ODG guidelines that we use, it's a national guideline. And we want them back at or before most people get back to work. However, if they go longer, there better be reasons for it we're going to, have to talk about. It. If they come back early and we have what we call a failed reentry, in other words, they come back early and then they get sent back out because they get re-injured, that is a mark against them. So don't rush them back if they're not ready. But do what you can to get them back safe. We have a very active return to work program different types of work schedules, different types of work. We will work closer with the supervisor to get people back to work. You know, we think of it as a three-legged stool. It's the employee, their treating provider, and our management. Those three legs of the stool need to be level to get that person back to work. I'll give you a perfect example. We had an incident early this year. Individual was injured on the job. It shouldn't have happened, it did. We've made all the, the corrections and stuff. It will not happen again. It should not happen again, given what we've done. It shouldn't have happened the first time. This person was out. Because of the nature of the injury, my, I was talking to my medical staff, and I said, we need to watch the stress on this one. Because that's going to be the issue. I, I saw the injuries. They sound bad, but they're, they're going to heal. My concern was the mental aspects of it, the stress of the incident. I said, there's something about this type of injury, from my experience as a safety person. And sure enough, the injuries healed, but it was the mental issues that this individual had. Now, from discussions with the employee, his counsel was trying to get him to stay out of work. He was anxious to get back to work. Our nurse case manager worked with him and the attorney. The attorney said, fine, work with him, get him. We got him the help he needed. It was going to take months to get it. We were able to intervene and get it done quickly. This gentleman had issues before the incident that didn't help once we had the incident. But because the employee, our medical people worked together, we were able to get this person back in a very timely manner. He's back to work, and by his own comments, he feels better now than he has in years. And he's not talking about his injury. He's talking about the other issues. And that is what I'm thinking right now. You read the news or watch the newspaper. I was shocked this morning when I got up and had another gun, gun incident. What, whatever your stance is on guns, I don't care. We have an issue of mental health in this country. That is one of our big challenges coming up in workers' comp. 
because I don't know. I'm not a professional. I don't know how to separate that from what happens at work and what's happening outside. We're going to have to deal with it. But we've got to be careful because it can't be an all or nothing. Because we have a lot of people that are out there hurt that need help. It has nothing to do with what's going on at work. But if something happens at work, it's going to trigger something. And we've got to be careful because you can bankrupt the system with that. That is a serious issue going forward in this country. So I don't know what we're going to do in workers' comp. It's something we need to continue to dialogue about. But that is, a, to me, is a watch out area. I have the benefit, I guess. We have a monthly meeting called the challenging case. And I have the nurse case manager that handles the work-related injuries. She comes in with a list of those we have a criteria for. And we have another one for the non-occupation. As of, we had one last Wednesday. I had two challenging cases in the occupation. I had over 20 on the non-oc. Of people that are out of work. I see both sides of the street. I see the occupation and the non-occupation. I know you deal with the non-oc. I'm here to tell you what you see on the, on the oc side is much a small piece of what's on the, on the non-occupational side. They bleed into one another. So please be conscious of that as we move forward. It's easy to put blinders on and say, I'm dealing with the work. I see it all. I've got the paid family leave, your paid family leave. I've got the FMLA. I've got the travel medicine. i got the whole shebang. It all comes across my desk. And it's amazing what's out there. Um, I, I think we all would applaud what we just saw here with the computerization and modernization. Again, as an industrial engineer, that's great stuff. I love that. Keep in mind, the human interface is critical. People need to be able to use it. We were just, Mary Beth and I were just talking about the portal. It took me two months to figure out how to get on the portal and get access to it. I finally made it. Still don't understand what to do in there, but I, I made it and I got my money. <laughs> that was the important part for my management. Um, we need to look at putting science into things. It's amazing to me when I read some of these claims. I'll give you a simple one. It was a noise case. Um, the gentleman had worked in a noise zone for a couple decades. He'd been out of it for six years. And in, during that whole time, he'd been down, had his hearing test. We had, you know, he lived on a farm. In fact, there was one case where he couldn't even take his hearing test when he was supposed to because the truck he rode in from work, which was over an hour ride, was so noisy that it already affected his hearing, so we couldn't do the hearing test. That's what we do the first thing in the morning. I uh, talked about how many hundreds of rounds of ammunition he fired a day, worked on a farm, construction work, and all this stuff. And he happened to come in because we started a new thing for power industrial trucks. We tightened up our physical exam program for that a couple years ago. He came in and he couldn't pass what was called a whisper test. So we naturally gave him a hearing test. And over the six years he'd been out of the hearing zone, his hearing had continued to diminish. So a couple weeks after he retired, he filed his hearing loss claim. We go in and say, look, this guy had a lot of stuff. We had a lot of stuff in his record of what he did outside. And for the last six years, he hadn't even been in a noise zone. And his hearing continued to decrease. So the logic was, OK, from when he left the hearing zone, the noise conservation zone, you're responsible for everything before that, not after it. I, I, help me understand something. Are you ready to go to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and say, you know what, get ready to hearing conservation program? Because it doesn't work. Because what you're Think about this, and I've, I've, these noise cases drive me crazy because noise is a very simple one. You either have the exposure and it causes the hearing loss, or you don't have the exposure. If you still have a hearing loss, there's something else doing it. Now you can tell, I know, because I've been through the training, you can tell a hearing loss that's what I'll call a biological one, natural one, versus one that's noise induced. But you cannot tell me that you can tell whether I'm running a circuit of saw at work or I'm running a circuit of saw at home remodeling, which one of those caused my hearing loss. However, when I read that, well, the employer had a hearing conservation program, that's telling me they had hearing protection. It's enforced by supervision. But yet, that obviously, that hearing protection didn't work because you had a hearing loss. But the, the, the individual can say, well, I wear earmuffs when I mow. I know I do. But their earmuffs work, ours don't. I, I, help me understand this. <laughs> I'm not saying who's right or wrong, but 
we need to look at science and say, what's going on here? Yes, you can have a hearing loss from work. I just, we need to weigh this. So that was just one of those. I already talked about mental health. The other thing that's really, and I faced this, and I'm a certified professional organist by training and experience and education. We have an aging workforce. I'm very cognizant of it. As I said, my average age right now is 54 or something like that. It was 57 a couple years ago, so we're making progress. I'm 63. When I get up in the morning, I stand up and say, okay, the knees work today. You know, we have people out there in the workforce, they don't have the same capabilities. And when we go in for a medical review, we look at range of motion, you actually compare left to right. Folks, I'm looking around this room, there aren't any teenagers in this room. Okay? We do not have the same capability now as we did when we were 20. Okay? I mean, as an ergonomist, I'm here to tell you that. That's a scientific fact. Okay? We need to be careful. I'm just heard this, my stump speech here. We need to be careful when we start evaluating people what they've lost. Don't go back to baseline as being 20 years old. If they're 60 years old, do it. I've got a gentleman with an report just crossed my desk yesterday, 67 years old. I had an employee that was in his 80s several years ago. I had a claimant about seven, eight years ago, finally passed away at over 100. His claim was from 1949. Okay? They would say, Kodak retirees live a long time, particularly if they have a workers' comp plan. <laughs> that was a joke in the office. The other thing we need to look at is leaving cognizant of what people do not occupational and occupational. We have people, they do a lot of stuff outside of work and they do stuff in work. If they're doing hand intensive stuff, be it digging, crocheting, building birdhouses, whatever, and they're keyboarded in work. And I, I, when I do ergonomics training, I tell people, your body doesn't know the difference between work and recreation. It's still an activity for those muscle groups. So you've got to think about that. We tend to dismiss that. So I think all of this would probably come under the phrase apportionment. We need to consider what makes sense for what the employer should be responsible for and what they shouldn't be responsible for. And if the all or nothing mentality is going to bankrupt us, I'm just telling you that. You know, Colorado, when I deal with that, because I deal with all the states, they have what they call the one percent. If you contributed one percent to the end, to the condition, you own the whole condition. It's like, wow. Well, sometimes it feels like we're nothing different here, I can tell you that. We need to look at this logically and say, this is responsible for the employer. This is some of its age, its other activities. We need to have some sensitivity to that. I'm not suggesting you dump everything on the employee. I, you know, Western New York, and I'll say Rochester, in fact, I even got a copy of the cover piece. The Rochester Chamber of Commerce in 1912 wrote a standard of regulation for in support of workers' compensation is kind of a mistake. In 1912, they wrote a draft standard for workers' comp regulation. You know Kodak had to be involved with that. There's a lot of companies up there. We're not, a, I don't think the employers are against workers' comp. I don't feel that way. Not with the people that I've worked with. All we're looking for is let's bring some logic to this thing. And I do want to. One, I want to thank the folks at the board. Because I'm going to tell you, I mentioned earlier about different people helping me out. When I have a question about something, I've learned that I'll pick up the phone and call the board. Typically, they'll find somebody that I should be talking to. And I've got to tell you, without exception, they've been fantastic at saying, here's what you can do, Mark. They sent me booklets, brochures, whatever. And I like to think that they've received the same respect from me when they ask me something that we'll take it on and not now. But I, they've been a big part of my education. When I call the board, Mary Beth, and any, all the folks under her, they have been exceptional. I've never been given a cold shoulder. So I want to thank them. Um, if you don't think the financials are huge, they are. They are absolutely huge. There's no way to describe it. When it comes into my quarterly report every quarter, that my CEO was mentioning workers' comp is one of the three headwinds. That's a sad story. That's a sad story. And when I look at people and they're not coming here and they mention workers' comp, I feel bad. I'm a long-time New Yorker. My kids and grandkids are here. I don't plan on retiring to Florida. 
I do want to thank you guys for the time. I probably went over what I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate it. Um, well, thank you, you very much. We got a question. Thank you. Yes. Good, good holiday. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming and for presenting to us uh, today. Uh, before I move to adjourn the meeting, I do want to recognize someone that's joining us today. It's our very new advocate for injured workers, Joel Cavalcante, who's here today. <laughs> um, some of you might know Joel. He's been with the board for some time, and he has uh, he brings with him a lot of institutional history and also a great desire and dedication to help injured workers in New York State. So we're, we couldn't be more pleased to welcome Joe to be with us here today. And I also want to say uh, that we wish everyone a very happy and safe Thanksgiving holiday um, from all of us here at the board. Uh, lastly, I will move to adjourn the meeting. So second. may I? Second. Yes, okay, <laughs> thank you. There was apparently a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I'm also a yes, that motion is passed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.